What is going on, fam? Welcome, welcome to the very first episode of the Elevate Everyday Podcast. And I'm super excited. This this podcast is all about fitness, personal development, mindset, and just creating your very best self. I'm super pumped. We've got a special guest for the very first episode. Um, we've got Patrick Lyons on here. So I'm not sure if you remember this, Patrick, but a while back we did a life, kind of a life coaching call. Um, you know, this was maybe two, three years back. Definitely uh, remember it. I yeah. remember the exact scenario that I was in when I had the call with you and everything. Okay, awesome. Cool. So, so yeah, we had some mutual friends. Patrick went to UT uh, and, you know, I just kind of saw what he was doing. It's pretty crazy. This guy's been in the, the fitness industry for a while. I mean, you started young, man. It's, it's inspiring to see what you're doing. Um, so, you know, you're actually one of the main reasons why I kind of went all in on fitness. I mean, just that, that conversation we had, just, I got a lot of out of it. It was what a 30 minute call, but I, I got a lot out of that and it was really cool. And it's just been cool to, to kind of meet you in person when I moved to Dallas and then kind of just seeing you, it's, it's just different when you're in proximity to someone, you know what I mean? Like when you, when you meet someone in person, it, it's weird to see like, cause it, it almost feels like online. It's like, it doesn't seem like it's tangible. Um, yeah. you, you see people doing certain things and you meet them in person. You're like, this is a real person. Like, and it's just inspiring in a, in a different way. Um, but guys sit back and relax. This is going to have a ton of value in it. This man, Patrick right here. Um, he not only has his own successful fitness business and is in crazy great shape himself, but also works a corporate job for Microsoft. So that's one of the main reasons I wanted him on here. Just, you know, if he can do it, there's absolutely no excuse for any of you guys out here that work at a nine to five and say you can't work out. So sit back and relax, get a ton of value out of this call with Patrick. I'm super excited, man. Thank you for, thank you for being on. Absolutely, man. Happy to be here. Cool. Sweet. So, so to kind of go right off of that, like the first question I have for you is, you know, I hear it all the time, maybe not with my, my fitness junkies, my, my own clients, because we've trained them to have a better mindset, but you know, from people just in passing or people maybe that are interested in getting into training, they're like, you know, I, I'm just too busy. I can't work out, you know, what's your response to this? And what, what would you say to someone like that? Yeah. So the most important thing there is an evaluation of priorities and an evaluation of where your time is going. Because if someone says that they don't have time, they have the exact same 168 hours a week that anyone has. It's just a matter of how they're allotting that. And even if you have a corporate job, that still means you have 128 hours outside of that, that you can do everything. Granted, you have to sleep. And so sleep, if you're sleeping eight hours a day is hopefully 56 hours of that. And that still leaves you, I believe it's 72 hours on top of all of that to make time for whatever else in your life you consider to be a priority. Obviously you got to eat. So that's going to take up some of your time. But even then it's like, you still have so much time outside of that. Like that should be exciting to anyone, even if they're saying, or they feel like they don't have time, just realizing how much time is there and then accepting that they are making the conscious choice to spend it a particular way. Or maybe they've been so used to the way that they're living that it's no longer conscious, it's almost subconscious, where they're just going about the flow of their day in an unproductive, inefficient way. Once you embrace this concept of 168 hours, then you realize, okay, if I really tried, I could probably make time for physical fitness literally every day of the week. And I don't even have to do that. I could make time for physical fitness five days a week. And then I definitely have time. So once you just go into that level of thinking, I just don't think that excuse exists for call it 99.9% .9 of people. The people I would call exceptions are if like you are literally working 12 hours a day and you have another job or two outside of that because you need to financially support a family and maybe even extended relatives. Maybe you're combating an illness and like you have just greatly extenuating circumstances. You have a, a child with special needs that requires hours and hours of your attention per day. Those sorts of things Obviously, I cannot personally relate to those, and those are going to be far outside of the, the realm of normalcy. But if you don't have like that degree of like stacked, compounded, extenuating circumstances, you have the time. <laughs> Man, if, if that's the very first answer, <laughs> I'm, I'm pumped for the rest of what this podcast is going to hold. So yeah, okay. it, 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 it pumps me up like this, this is the reason I wanted you on. And, you know, this is the reason why I wanted to start a podcast just because I don't know if you can relate to this, Patrick, like just getting 
a conversation going with someone that just has a like mind and like, you know, has similar habits. It's just, man, it, it's, it's infectious. And I'm hoping that the people listening to this can, can feed off of that. Um, but that, that was a fantastic answer. I mean, you can tell you were what, what did you do, study at UT engineer? engineer? I studied mechanical engineering. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell you've got that kind of like quantifiable <laughs> type yeah. of mind. 100%. I, I love how you broke it down into the actual hours. And I think that just makes it, you know, it for the people out there that are like numbers driven, or you've got kind of that engineer type mindset, like just literally look at the numbers at it like that. Like you've got, what did you say? 72 hours outside of like sleeping and work. Even if you work a corporate job, like I'm sure, like you said, Patrick, like there's some things, if you didn't complete audit of your life, you'd see, okay, like I'm wasting time looking at TikTok this many hours per week. Like I'm sure if you looked at all the hours or if someone was walking around with a clipboard, like looking at what you're doing every hour of the day, I'm sure there's things that you could check off that if, if you made fitness a priority and it was important to you, you can make it happen. So yeah. 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 yeah and th one thing just to add to that, that I have implemented in the last call it month or so, I realized that I have so concretely laid out my day that it almost can be stressful at times. And I didn't want it to be all consuming. It never has gotten to that point because I'm very, very intentional about like practicing self-care habits to de-stress, you know, things like going for walks, meditating, taking time for myself, um, stretching, anything like that, that I know is going to help me just feel better. But even then I was like, I think I need some part of my day where I legitimately don't have to do anything productive. I just want to be completely just, you know, whether it's silly or just mindless. And so I was like, okay, well, with the way I've laid out my day, I, I don't know if I have time for that. But then I, I thought about it. I was like, you know, when it comes to my meal times, especially if I'm solo, just eating alone in my house, that's time that like normally I'm just kind of mindlessly scrolling through social media anyways. I could totally put something on that that is like a total break from reality. And so what I did is I literally spend basically my entire lunch every day now watching like YouTube videos that make me laugh because I just wanted a time in my day where I don't have to think about anything productive. I don't have to feel like I need to accomplish anything. And what that made me realize is like, even with the life I lead that I believe is nearly maxed out, capped out in terms of how I'm spending my time, I was still able to make 30 minutes to do that because it was occupying the same time as something else. And so that's something that people can also think about is habit stacking, whether it's driving, going for a walk, sitting, doing mindless things like eating, you can put things on top of those to still do things that you feel like are lacking or that you want to put into your day. I think that's really good. I mean, yeah, habit stacking. So not sure if you, if you've read Atomic Habits by, by James Clear, um, but he talks about that a lot. Uh, and I think it's it's important what you said too. Uh, it doesn't need to necessarily be like a productive habit every single time, but it's just about like all right, if you're if you're doing something, you know, and it, you're able to multitask it, like eating a meal, you know, whether it's a content that you're consuming that's productive to your day, or if it's just a time like if you would have been watching something funnier or you know mindless on social media later while you're not doing anything maybe yeah like stack it with something that you're doing like eating a meal to to save that extra time i, I think that's really important for people to kind of conceptualize that that concept there um but yeah i'm big on you know habit stacking and making sure that the content you consume this is something i talk about a lot like the content you consume is is productive but there is times like if, if you're going to be consuming that type of content anyway like if you need kind of a break yeah stack it with something that is productive and something that I think might help you get some cardio done or something like that, you know, some of those, those things that are tough for you, if you stacked it with something that you do like, um, like you're saying, like, if you're eating a healthy meal or doing some cardio, if you stack it with something like that you do like on YouTube, maybe that'll get you to want to do that activity even more. So yeah. I think that's big. So that's, that. cool. that's cool. Yeah. And I think the, the self-care thing, that's actually something that I'm going to talk about with my clients on, we have weekly like coaching calls as a group. Um, and my, my take on that with, with what you're saying with self-care, um, you know, I think, yeah, it is important to have that downtime and, you know, have stuff where you can kind of just shut off. That's super important. Like you need to make sure you have those times, but also I think the people that the things that people don't think about a lot of times, self-care is actually like 
a lot of times exercise and sleeping right and like these good health, health habits are actually self-care and this is going to make you feel better you know for the other parts of your life the other 72 hours or whatever that you're not at your job or working out and doing all this stuff so yeah you know, yeah. yeah yeah one thing that i i've talked with several of my clients about because i've worked with over 700 clients at this point and when you've worked with that many people you've dealt with literally every life circumstance that you can imagine anything from marriage to divorce to deaths in the family to car accidents to serious injuries and everything in between and so i've had clients who will come to me and say like patrick you you know maybe you can't necessarily relate to exactly what i'm going through but like how do you maintain you know a, a healthy lifestyle or healthy habits when you are dealing with like life's greatest stressors and one of my answers to that is genuinely that my healthy habits are specifically what allow me to handle life's greatest stressors. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing where by having that semblance of routine and normalcy in some aspect or multiple aspects of my life is almost like what allows me to you know, at least temporarily pull away from the stressor and thinking about it consciously or doing those things are specifically what allow me to get through them. It's like, if I didn't work out, I know that I would feel worse. If I didn't work out, I'd probably be spending more time stressing over the thing that I was stressing about in the first place. If I didn't get in my steps for the day or go for a walk outside in the outdoors, getting my vitamin D, that sort of thing, I know that I would feel worse. And one of the common responses that I will get to that is, Patrick, that might work for you, but like, that's overwhelming for me. And I'm not saying that that's not valid. Like there very well can be people and circumstances to where like, it's so great and heavy that it is difficult to even imagine doing any of that. And you don't have to do all of it, but I don't think that doing none of it will help you more than doing some of it. So basically practicing at least one or two daily rituals, habits, whatever you want to call it to give you that semblance of normalcy. 100%. Yeah. I completely resonate with that. Um, you know, I've had lots of like clients or even potential clients like say things like that. Um, and I don't know what it I think it just takes being in the in that situation and then doing these habits and realizing that it it does make you feel better. Cause mm -hmm. I wish I could just like give the way I feel to someone and be like, look, experience this. Like when, when you're doing yeah. these things, like you feel better. Like it, I know it may seem like you you have no time and you're too stressed out to do it. But like when you make that time and you you do some of these simple habits, like we're, it doesn't need to be something drastic, but like you're saying like they don't need to be me or you, right, Patrick? Like they don't need to work out five, six times a week and be like a fitness professional or fitness model or, or, or anything like that. But if they're just, you know, making some time, 30 minutes, three times a week to move around um, and and eat right, I just wish we could show them how much better they would feel, you know, so completely yeah. resonate with that. But let's let's go ahead. I've got some questions. I, I want to make sure that I uh, ask you some of these. So another thing that I hear from from a lot of like, you know, people that I'm just reaching out to or that reach out to me that, you know, one of the excuses I hear sometimes is I, I call it an excuse. Maybe it's not an excuse. Maybe some people just genuinely feel this way, but they're just, you know, they're satisfied with where they're at. You know, they're, they're like, you know, I'm I'm just basically going to maintain the rest of my life where, where I'm at. Um, I feel like you know, personally, and you seem like the same way, like just, you seem ambitious and we're always looking to just progress. And that, like that progress is what feels good for me. It's not necessarily like, I don't like the way I look, but it's just, I want to see progress because it feels good. Um, but what would you say to, to someone that's maybe like comfortable with where they're at and they, they don't see the need to try to progress any further? Yeah. So I would ask a couple of questions and I would frame it in a way of what it means to them to have a successful life. Because if you can frame it in this way, you give yourself a North Star that is far deeper than just say an aesthetic change or just an amount of weight lifted or just any one thing. It's more of the macro holistic view of like, what are you working toward? And so I went on this kind of introspective journey starting out really deeply uh, at the beginning of COVID. And what I realized for me is that what success is, is not any particular body. It's not any particular, you know, weight on an exercise but it is happiness, fulfillment, and health while helping others. Those are kind of my four pillars where the fourth pillar of helping others is a subset of fulfillment. So it's really happiness, fulfillment, and health. And so 
my pursuit of daily betterment is always working toward one or more of those three things. And so if someone says that they are content with their life, I would say, I would ask them, it's almost like a three-part question where it's like, do you feel happy on either all or most days to the highest degree possible? Do you feel fulfilled on all or most days to the highest degree possible? And do you feel, feel healthy uh, all or most days to the highest degree possible? And odds are one of those answers is no, at least one of those answers, if not all of them. And I would wager that probably all three of them are lacking in some way or another because happiness fulfillment and health are not just like a, a simple concept each of them have multiple components to them and so if we're just diving into the health aspect if someone feels like they're in a good spot they're complacent or they're, they're satisfied with where they're at there are a couple of kind of deeper things to reflect on i would say the deepest is a longevity perspective where it's like okay is an aspiration of yours to live a long life if the answer to that is yes there are probably about 12 things that they could do to make their life longer than the way they're currently living. Examples, I can't go through every single one of them, but examples would be like maintaining a healthy body weight according to like body fat and BMI standards. Um, so like a couple of examples of that is like a man definitely should have a waist size under 35.5 inches and a woman should definitely have a waist size. I believe it's under 31.5. I might be getting it off by one inch or so, but it's like that sort of a baseline where it's like, okay, is your waistline at least at that level? If not, then you have an element that you can improve upon that can hopefully expand or extend your lifespan. And then other aspects would be like, are you getting the optimal amount of vitamin D daily? Are you consuming phytonutrients or plant chemicals in the form of, you know, micronutrients and fiber every single meal of the day. If you're not, you could probably extend your lifespan by doing so. Are you getting at least 10,000 steps a day, but potentially up to 15,000 steps a day for like a very incremental amount of additional longevity benefit? These are all questions that you could ask that like, again, someone who is complacent, the answer to those things are probably no, but if they have this long-term view of wanting to live a longer life, they should be doing those things. And so framing it in that way can really help people to realize like, I might feel okay right now, but I need to reflect on how my actions today are going to compound into what I become decades down the road or what I don't become if I'm not alive. For sure. Yeah. I, I think the the North star thing that you said at the very beginning of that is, is really important. It's like, and I think most people, they don't take the time to create the vision, like the clear vision of what that North star is for them. So I think if you don't have that, like if you never take the time to like know actually where you want to go, then I think that's step number one. And then, like you said, you know, just knowing kind of like what are the things that I need to do to get there? Because I think in the fitness industry, sometimes it's it's either there's too much information and people are just thrown in different directions or sometimes they just they take the generalized approach of like, I know what I need to do. I just need to move around more and eat less uh, to get where I want to go so that they feel like they know what to do. And it's just like, I, I don't know if that seems like an excuse to them not to do it because they, <laughs> they just say, you know, I know what to do. I'm just not doing it. Um, so they just kind of throw it out like that. But, you know, I, I think having that North star is step number one, and then knowing kind of like what you can do to get to that point is where, you know, seeking professional help can, can really help like someone like, like me or you, you know, just making sure that they kind of know what things are going to help them get there in a way that fits their lifestyle to make sure that they, they can stick to it without, um, you know, taking their whole lifestyle out of the picture, um, with these health habits. So, yeah, definitely. I, I like that. Well, cool. So what, what got you into fitness in the beginning, Patrick, or like what, where did you start? Like, yeah, you, I, I started as a very skinny guy. I was five foot 11, 100, five foot 11, 139 pounds. And uh, that was at the age of 15. I'm six foot now. So like, obviously I had a little bit of growing left to do, but in general, I was a very skinny guy. And so now I'm, uh, I'm getting, I'm leaning out, but I peaked at my bulk at 192. So it was like a 53 pound difference from where I started at, um, you know, kind of beginning skinny as to peak of bulk. And so it was kind of like, going on a fitness journey allowed me to find my confidence in myself because I didn't just start out skinny. I started out not liking the way I looked or felt. It was like right. from a very young age, literally nine or 10 years old, I would look at myself in the mirror and I just genuinely didn't like what I saw. And that's kind of a, a sucky thing for a nine or 10 year old to feel. I don't think any nine or 10 year old deserves to feel that way, but that was just my reality. 
And fitness is truly what allowed me to find that. It took a long time because I was just doing what any, I guess, nine or 10 year old does when they uh, are looking for answers is just like, I was trying anything and everything. It was like, I didn't have a rhyme or reason to it. It was just like, whatever I came across, that's what I was going to try. I didn't know about, you know, scientific backing. I didn't know about how to assess things from an objective perspective, but it led me down a path of fitness where I was doing push-ups, I was doing pull-ups, I was doing sit-ups. I was uh, eating what my mom made. And luckily I grew up with a mom who cooked very healthily. So I was having fruits and vegetables and lean protein sources every day. Uh, But it wasn't until I got a fitness coach myself around the age of 15 and then again at 19 that I started learning macros, which is what I learned around the age of 15 or so. Mm -hmm. And then when I really started learning how to work out in a gym and kind of put all the pieces together at the age of 19 when I was also working with a coach. And it had such a transformative effect on my life that I wanted to help others achieve the exact same sort of feeling and results that I did. And that's exactly what led me to become a coach. It's awesome, man. Yeah, we we have very similar parallel kind of backgrounds uh, with how we got started and kind of what what I feel like got us into wanting to be a coach. Because um, I well, I played football, I was, but I was always like super small when I when I was growing up. Like I was always one of the oldest kids in my class just because of the way my birthday fell in the year. But I was always like one of the smallest. I weighed like 120 pounds in high school before I started put on size and got into working out. Um, and then like when football was over, I got a personal trainer at Gold's Gym, like an in-person one. Um, it was a great experience. Then it made me want to go study this. And then, you know, I think we we both have a mutual friend or my coach right now, you know, is is uh, the coach of Christian Guzman, Alex Toplin. Um, and yeah, so like my, my first experience and then this experience that I'm going through right now, it's just like, man, I, I, I think the thing that people don't see too is, you know, even at the level that we're at, you know, there's so much value in just kind of having an outside eye. Um, and so, yeah, I think just, you know, the experiences that we've had that have, that have gotten us to the point we're at now, um, you know, I wish we could share that with everyone. I think that that's what drives us to, to like, keep trying to get new clients, you know, just, just to show everyone how much better you could feel about yourself and how much confidence you can gain, how much enjoyment you can get out of this lifestyle. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool that we've got pretty similar kind of parallel backgrounds and everything. But, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot. You've, you, you're, you know, you're not a small guy now. <laughs> you're, you're a big guy. You're ripped. Like, what drives you at this point? Like, what, what kind of drives you to want to progress? Because you, you talked about your North Star. Like, what, what's kind of your North Star? And what's, what's driving you to, to keep going right now? Yeah, when it comes to the world of fitness now, kind of like alluding to what you were saying earlier, I'm not at a point anymore where there's really any day where I say, you know, I don't like the way I look or I don't like where I'm at with my fitness journey. I love the way I look and I love how I feel. And I'm very, very satisfied with like the level of results that I've achieved. But also to your point, I am still of that belief of like self betterment on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis where like, I just want to improve in one way or another. And I had a leg injury for three years. So I have a three year under development of my lower body compared to my upper. And that means that I have the most progress that I can make there. So at the very least, I definitely want to keep progressing with my leg strength and size, but I really want to continue progressing with my entire body strength and size, because the more that I learn and the more that I train myself through optimal scientific programming, I realize that there are still incremental improvements that I can make pretty much across the board. And so it's really about that. And then in terms of what keeps me going, to like actually take on those daily actions that are necessary to make those things happen. I always give myself time specific goals that have a level of urgency to them. Like if you were to just generically say, you know, by January 1st of next year, I I want to like look better. It's good to have a time specific thing, but technically it, there's not a huge urgency to it because there's nothing on January 1st besides it being the turn of the year that's going to really incentivize you to look your best. So what I do personally is I either schedule a photo shoot or a vacation or both. Because if you have something like that, it's on a specific day or for a specific period of time and there's really no going back it's like that's the day it's happening and so i have to look the way i want to look on that day so for me right now it's working toward toward august 1st 2023 when i'm hosting my first destination vacation retreat on the island of oahu in hawaii on the second day of that trip on august 2nd we got the most in-demand photographer in hawaii who's going to do a photo shoot of each of us on the island and so it's that thing where it's like there's no going back like that day is the day i need to look my very best uh, and so I have a motivator for my daily actions up until that point. That's awesome. Yeah. I, 
I think that's huge. Like almost like kind of putting pressure on yourself with, with an event or something, you know, in the future so that it makes it like, all right, I've got, and it doesn't need to be like a bodybuilding show or anything like that. Cause I don't, I don't even think you've done a, you've never competed or anything. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's not like you got to become bodybuilders guys and like make, make you make yourself step on stage or even like run a marathon or anything crazy. Like it can be as simple as what Patrick is saying, like a photo shoot, you know, anyone can do that. Anyone can plan a vacation, but it's just like something that you're trying to work towards um, to, to make sure that you've got a deadline and it's like, makes it a time period, makes it more concrete and urgent. Like Patrick is saying, I think that's really big. And one thing I wanted to put a pin in, pin on what you said, Patrick, about like how you, you know, you have kind of a, a discrepancy between your lower body, your upper body, and that, that progress that, you know, like you feel like you're, you know, you, you, you have a lot of progress to make with your legs that drives you. I feel like it does the opposite to some people where they're like, I'm so far behind in a certain area where it, it like makes them less motivated. So what do you think is wired in your brain or how can we rewire some people's brains to like, you know, think of your deficits, not as demotivating, but actually motivating to want to get better. Yeah. I think that the way you framed it is really the right way to look at it because if you have a deficit, that actually means that your potential for progress is likely greater than others is. So you can make faster progress in those areas and that can be really exciting and motivating all on its own. Furthermore, if you make progress in your lower body, it will literally make it easier to make progress of your entire body because you're stimulating more muscle fibers per workout and assuming that you're having the right level of uh, intensity of your workouts and you have the right overall physical activity in terms of steps and things like that, you're literally going to be burning more calories because you're working out your entire body and in turn you can eat more and most people want to eat more. So it all kind of uh, plays together. For sure. Yeah. I think what you said about, um, you know, it's, if you've got the deficit, that actually makes it easier to to make that progress compared to someone that doesn't have that deficit, because it's like someone just getting into lifting. Like I would, you probably feel the same way, Patrick. Like, I wish I could get those newbie gains again. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's super exciting and fun. Like anyone that, that hasn't started lifting and you're wanting to put on size, like just realize and know that the beginning is the most fun part because you're, you're able to put on like 20 pounds of muscle in the first year, you know, even maybe more than that. Um, so, so yeah, like when you get to the advanced level, like me and Patrick, it, it gets a little bit harder to make that progress. So take advantage of that and get started if, if you haven't yet. And it's like, man, like it, it's a super exciting part in your fitness journey. So I just wanted to put that in there, but yeah, I, I love that you said that because, um, one thing I've been thinking about recently is like different movies and TV shows that I wish I could go back in time to a point where I didn't know the ending so I could experience it authentically again. And I almost feel like that's kind of like a, a fitness journey parallel where it's like once you get more advanced and you realize how much harder it is to make progress in the later stages, you wish you could go back and re-experience again. Like, what was it like to make that first year of progress? Right. But then, you you know, you think about it realistically and you're like, OK, I don't want to go back to the very beginning because I like <laughs> where I'm at now. But theoretically, just the idea of being able to experience that again is that exciting. And so if you're at that point just like the, where you haven't worked out before, or you've never optimized all the factors of your training and exercise and recovery, like the potential for progress is insane for you and you should totally take advantage of it. For sure. Yeah. I think the, the funny thing I want to talk about with that though, is like, I did all the wrong things <laughs> in the beginning. So if I could go back, there'd be a lot of things that, you know, knowing what I know now that I would change. Um, but the, the thing with that too, you know, cause that was before I like got that first coach is like when I first got into lifting, it was all just kind of like what I was, I was just eating a ton to try to gain weight. So I put on fat too fast um, and everything just, you know, just trying to, I was working out like two hours a day, like every day, not really recovering properly and stuff like that. So um, yeah, my, my whole point of saying that too, is if you're getting into it, there's so much more information out there right now um, that, that, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Just make sure that maybe you have kind of a filter or someone you can bounce ideas off of. Um, but there's the information is there. Um, the, the hard part is the execution though. So just make sure, uh, you know, maybe you've got some sort of mentor or just someone you can bounce ideas off of and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I could go back kind of not make those mistakes, but then again, that's what got me to where I am now. And that's how I can actually articulate a lot of those mistakes and help others not make those mistakes too. So I don't know if you kind of made mistakes when you first got started or just didn't have a perfect, you know, entrance into the the fitness world, but, but that's something I just, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest mistake that I made was 
I mean, kind of what led to my lower body injury in the first place is that I was literally going too hard, too fast, like right off the gate, right out, right out of the gate. That's the term. And uh, so like, if I could go back, the most important thing I would do is literally tell myself that you're going to make the new begins anyways. And so you might as well keep your body sustainable or like allow for longevity throughout the process because it's like i was literally probably training to failure on like every single lower body set of virtually every exercise and there's just not a need to do that especially at the beginning when like your priority should be mastering the form and technique first and foremost for sure and yeah i mean it's like if i could go back and tell myself that i might not have a three-year leg deficit compared to my upper body and that'd be pretty cool but uh, now I can teach others the right way to do it from the beginning. Yeah. And I think maybe that might even be sometimes, you know, in people's minds, like they, I, w- I would assume actually that a lot of people kind of have a mindset like us, like just when you, when you go into it, you've got to go super hard. Maybe that's what gets some people overwhelmed too. And maybe just knowing that, you know, it actually is more, I would say, argue about recovery and making sure that you kind of build back up your muscles and the nutri- nutrition side so it's not like you need to be in the gym six times a week for hours on end, guys. Like, you know, it, it doesn't take that much if you're if you're doing kind of the right things, working smarter, not harder. Like, you know, I, I just wanted to stress that to people. And maybe that might ease people's minds to get into it more because it it really, I feel like, takes less effort than people realize and more just kind of like planning ahead, basically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I do think it's a common misconception, just even the concept that soreness is a direct marker of progress, because it's definitely not. If you're not familiar, not you personally, I mean, anyone listening, uh, soreness is really an indication of either novel stimulus, meaning new stimulus, something you haven't experienced before, either the specific exercise or the angle that you worked it or the amount of weight or volume, any number of factors could play a role, but it's literally the novel stimulus aspect of it, or uh, literally like metabolite buildup. So if you do, you know, a hundred reps of an exercise, you're going to be far more sore than if you only did 10 reps of an exercise, because you have way more metabolite buildup that is just going to give you that feeling of soreness. And that is not a direct indicator of progress. In fact, research has directly shown that if you hit, hit fatigue in over 30 reps compared to under 30 reps, your hypertrophy or muscle building potential is about half. So even if you reach absolute total failure at hundred reps and absolute total failure at 20 reps, that 20 rep set actually resulted in more progress than the hundred rep set, despite that hundred rep set resulting in way more terrible feeling the next day. I think that's, that's a huge thing that would just blow people's minds <laughs> that yeah, don't yeah. Know, know a whole lot about, you know, the fitness industry and everything. But, um, what, you know, since you're a numbers guy, you kind of like quantifying everything. I like that. Like what percentage, like if you had to put a percentage on it, cause a lot of people are like, it's 90% nutrition, which I don't agree with, honestly, but like what, what percentage do you think it is like exercise and what percentage do you think it is nutrition in reaching most people's goals? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I generally do say around 80% nutrition, 20% gym. But the thing that's important to emphasize in there is that it also depends on like, what it is you're asking it for. Like, are you asking what resulting effect of fat loss or muscle building comes from which part of the equation? If so, then yeah, I would probably go with like around that 80-20. But even then, that would be an oversimplification because Nutrition and exercise aren't the only two components anyways. Sleep matters immensely. Mm -hmm. Sleep studies have directly shown that if you get six hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep, you literally lose about half as much or 50% more muscle than if you were to get the full eight hours. And what I'm saying is like, if you lose 10 pounds and you're sleeping six hours a night versus you lose 10 pounds and you're losing, uh, you're sleeping eight hours a night, you literally lose about 50% more muscle mass from the six hours of sleep per night. So in that way, you can't say that nutrition and exercise are the only two components. There's definitely recovery that is in large part from sleep, but really from really everything else, you know, the amount of steps you're getting, how physically active you are. And this comes down to, in part, something called nutrient partitioning. And it's basically how your body uses the nutrients you give it. And the amount of sleep you get very significantly affects that, as does the amount of stress that you were under. So if you take a very low stress person versus a very high stress person, the low stress person has far more ability to lose fat and not lose muscle and has a higher ability to build muscle rather than gain fat. For sure. Very good detailed answer. And 
yeah, I just got a whoop. So I'm trying to track my sleep and my stress. I think it's pretty cool. I'm just, just literally <clears throat> wearing it for the first time today. So we'll see how it goes. But nice. so yeah, that's something I do with my clients too, is just making sure that that's something we pay attention to. I always send them out weekly when we're getting their weigh-ins. I also have them rank their, their sleep and their stress from one to 10. And, and yeah, like I've noticed like, man, if we can improve that sleep, I've noticed people can just make so much better results. So people, man, do not sacrifice your sleep to like work out more, even, you know, yeah. don't, don't trade certain health habits for others, you know, just try to try to improve on each of them over time and see what you can do to, to just incrementally get all these categories better. Um, yeah. And so just, just to, to add to that, one thing that I emphasize for my clients is that sleep is literally a better pre-workout than any pre-workout product on the planet. Yeah. Like if you are not getting sufficient sleep, you are completely selling yourself short in terms of your performance athletically, your performance with lifting weights, with your ability to handle the load of a workout in the first place. Like yeah. all of that will suffer if you're not getting enough sleep. And so if you are getting low sleep and then caffeinating yourself so you feel awake, like yeah. you're you're missing the point. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I've had a, this conversation so many times <laughs> with people like take, they're taking pre-workout like 6 PM to go work out. And they're like, why can't I sleep? <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's pretty obvious and stuff, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so yeah, I feel like we could go on and on about sleep. I mean, all these categories, but what, one thing I wanted to ask you was like for you personally, you know, what's the best way to build good habits? What's what, what would, what's worked for you? And cause you've built, I mean, man, you feel like, I feel like you're a machine and sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm the same way, but, uh, like what has helped you kind of get all these good habits in your place? Like, do you have a system? Is it time management? Do you have like trackers? Like what, how can someone kind of replicate putting good habits into place into their life? Yeah. So what I was alluding to earlier, when I mentioned that I have kind of crafted my ideal life in terms of this happiness, fulfillment and health thing and using those as the North Star. The reason why I went through that introspective journey at the beginning of COVID is because that's also when I started writing my book on the subject of habits. Nice. And so I've not only reflected on my own life, but I've delved very deep into the research behind habits and how you form the habits. And uh, basically the conclusion that I've come to is that the best way to form a habit is known as piggybacking. And that means that you do something that follows something that is already a routine part of your day. I because see. what that means is you don't have to create an artificial cue. The cue is already there because a habit has three components. You have the cue, the actual action and the reward. And so without all three of those components, the habit doesn't form in the first place. But once you have those, it literally forms a neural network in your brain and every time you repeat the habit, the neural network is strengthened. It's like, think about neurological connections that are like threads to start, but then they become a spider web and then they become like a cable and they just keep getting stronger over time because they're reinforced. But again, it requires all three of those components, the cue, the action, and the reward. So if you have something you're trying to insert into your day, try and find the most easy part of your day that you can just piggyback off of the second this thing happens that's when i go on to the next thing so like for me the second my corporate work day gets done that's when i drink my non-caffeinated pre-workout because <laughs> i don't want to sacrifice <laughs> sleep because my corporate work day does usually get done around 5 p.m. and I'm not going to impair sleep quality but that's all to say work day gets done take my pre-workout get in the car go to the gym and if I didn't have a corporate work day, I would just have to find a different cue. Maybe that cue is just, you know, the second I wake up, I meditate, I shower, I, I eat breakfast. And then the second breakfast gets done, that's when I go to the gym. doesn't matter what the specific cue is, but it has to be a consistent cue. Because as soon as that cue goes away, you will likely find that it is far more difficult to practice the habit. This yeah. is also why when you go on vacation, some habits you're going to find, not necessarily working out, maybe working out, but not necessarily all of your habits are going to be as easy to follow because the cue has been removed. It's like the easy example I think of is I always listen to a podcast when I'm in the car. And then when I'm on vacation, if I'm not the one driving, I'm probably not listening to any podcast while I'm on that vacation because the cue has been removed. I'm no longer getting in the car, starting the car and uh, turning on the podcast, but that's how I would establish habits. Yeah. that. That's huge. And I think, you know, just people don't realize how small sometimes the steps can be, or like the the smaller habits that you associate with, with the bigger habits. Like you said, like literally just taking that non-caffeinated pre-workout, you know, maybe getting in the car, like, but once you do those two small little things, like that ball is rolling. It's like the, these little tiny, 
you know, steps lead to something bigger. Like when, once you do that small thing, you get a, actually a little dopamine hit and it makes you want to kind of get to the next step. Um, and that motivation kind of snowballs and it makes it so that once you do those smaller things, like the big thing is actually like, it's just a, it's just what you're doing. Like at that point, like it just, it just feels natural. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think that's huge. Um, and I think to kind of relating back to something that we talked about earlier, um, I think, you know, people let just their stress and their, their stress from like the work day, and everything just, just cause them to kind of like, you know, it almost like cripples them. Not really. It just like causes them to not want to do anything when they get home. But I think if they did take those little steps, you know, if they, if they had those little rituals that kind of got that ball rolling, it would get them out of that and have them get into those healthy habits. So I think that's yeah, and cool. I've actually worked with a lot of clients who've brought that exact same concern as I'm sure you have, where it's like, you know, at the end of the workday, I'm tired. I don't want to do anything. And I tend to ask them like, what do you do when you get home? And usually the answer is like, I lay on the couch or I sit on my bed. And it basically is something that establishes too much comfort at the wrong time of the day. Right. Because as soon as you give into comfort, the will to do other productive things is virtually zero. And so the second your workday gets done, if you must go home first, don't allow yourself to sit down anywhere because as soon as you do, you know, what's not going to happen. You're not going to get up and go to the gym. So basically if you have to go home, go home, change into your workout clothes immediately, take your pre-workout and leave. If you can just take your change of clothes with you to work. So you never have to go home. You don't even have the temptation to give into comfort and then you can go to the gym. hundred percent that I think that has a lot to do with removing that friction between you and, and like the habit. Um, and then like also um, like, on the opposite side of that, you can create more friction between you and maybe the unhealthy habit with like sitting on the couch, you know, make it harder for yourself somehow. Maybe like something James Clear talks about, like put your remote for the TV in the closet or something, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Cre create less friction between you and the, the habit that you're trying to create, create more friction between you and the habit that you're trying to stop. And I, I think you kind of touched on that with that answer. So I thought that was good. Um, well, cool. So just a couple more questions. I know you're, you're a busy guy, Patrick. Um, but one thing kind of wanted to get deep with this one because you're, you're like a unicorn with this, honestly, for probably most people, but I, I used to drink a lot. Um, I stopped drinking, changed my life completely. I haven't, I haven't drank in like over six months, like I haven't had a sip of anything. Um, and I know, I don't know if it's still the case, but I don't think you know, I, when I was watching your social media content a while back, you, you said you never drank or anything, which is, you know, most people that probably blows their minds. So that's awesome. So do you think a big reason why some people, you know, aren't as motivated or can't create these habits does have something to do with some of the vices that are just like, you know, almost like socially enforced on us or just like vices that are just like the social norms that, that people feel like they have to partake in or have a part of their life? Do you feel like there's things like that or even just other habits that are just like the social norm that causes people to feel like they can't start good, healthy habits and, and kind of demotivates them? I would say that it's rare for me to find someone who won't start a healthy lifestyle because of alcohol, but the alcohol certainly makes it harder to have the utmost level of health because inherently alcohol is poison. And it will deter you from your goals in one way or another, meaning that like, even if if me and another person live the exact same life, but they're drinking alcohol and I'm not, it's just going to result in better outcomes for me from a health perspective because of the fact that I'm not drinking. But from like a, a pressure standpoint in a way, I actually just had someone message me right before this call about alcohol and like how I handle social situations with it. And it's, you know, it's so much the norm that it's like, especially when I was in college, I would, you know, carry a red solo cup and just fill it with water because then there isn't like the, the stigma where it's like, oh, why aren't you drinking that kind of thing? And it's like, I don't think that that should be the way it is anyways. It should just be, you know, up to an individual person. Like, are they going to drink or are they not? But if you must, you know, just hold the red solo cup. But at the same time, I think that one of the issues that drinking leads to is very, very late nights that lead to poor sleep. Even if you didn't drink, if you were just in the the lifestyle of going out on a very regular basis until, you know, two, three, four a.m., um, it's very difficult to get quality sleep when you are shifting your sleep schedule by so many hours. Um, it's called the weekend lifestyle effect in the scientific literature, where it's like you sleep on the exact same schedule five days a week, and then you flip it by like two or three hours, and that directly impairs sleep quality. 
Um, and so that can be a reason why, again, it doesn't necessarily impair you from living a healthy lifestyle. It just makes it harder to get the results as quickly. Yeah. And I can completely, from my own experience, like living it one way and then living it the way I'm living it now, you know, without drinking now. And even when kind of in the, in between when I was like, kind of, it was kind of a process for me to stop drinking completely, which I'll probably, you know, drink in moderation sometimes on occasions, you know, in the future. But for right now, it's just, it, I have no, like, I'm not tempted to at all right now. And it's just like, I'm like, why even have it be a part of my life right now? Um, but you know, kind of being on, on one end of it now where I'm at now, I can just see the drastic difference of my mindset, my clarity, and I think, like you said, a huge part of that is the sleep. So I think if if you can find a way to to still keep good sleep hygiene while keeping moderation of alcohol in your in your life, like it is possible. You know, I think it's it's possible to to have it in your life somewhat. Um, but like you said, it's a poison. It does affect your sleep. Uh, and like sleep is just something that you really want to try to protect because there's so many benefits. And I can attest. Um, you know, being on one end now doing what I'm doing now, like I'm so mentally clear, just feels so much better. So that, that was just something I wanted to touch on. And like, I think it's, it's probably inspiring for a lot of people that you just never have. I mean, that's inspiring to me. I mean, you, you impressed me with a lot of different things, but, <laughs> but that, that's really cool that, you know, especially I think you were even maybe not in a fraternity, but in like an organization at UT, I'm sure there's just lots of social pressures and just in life in general, things come up all the time. So it's cool that you've been able to just sustain from that your entire life. Pretty awesome. So thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely uh not the normal choice by any means, but it's like one that I'm very happy with having made. Um, because it's like the longer that I go through my life, the more I just embrace what my true identity is. And if you had asked me like five or six years ago, like, hey, do you think you're ever gonna drink? My answer was usually like I'll probably drink at some point in my life. Like, I don't know when yet, but, you know, maybe with my wife when I have one or maybe at my wedding or maybe with friends. But as I've gotten older, I realized, like, I don't think there's ever a reason for me to drink. Like, I was only saying that because I almost felt like it would be weird to live a life in which I didn't drink alcohol. But now I realize, like, that's only because it's the societal norm. Like, I don't have any desire to put a poison in my body. Like, yeah. that's just the way I look at it. Yeah, that's good. That's, I mean, that's a healthy perspective. So I think that's, I, I don't know why. I, I think it should, that should be the norm right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. yeah, well, cool, man. Well, we, we can wrap this one up pretty soon, but like what, what's next for you? Cause I know you're, you're working on, you've been writing a book for a while. Um, I've been seeing, so I'm sure it's going to be awesome when it, when it comes out eventually. And then, you know, I know that you said you're, you're going to be doing a podcast yourself and stuff like what, but what's kind of like in the works right now, anything that you want to share, or like promote or anything like that? Um, I mean, the biggest thing that's next is in the very near future, which is just the retreat that I'm hosting in Hawaii, but that's hopefully going to become more of a recurring thing to uh, go to different destination locations. And I didn't mention earlier, but that retreat is a fitness oriented retreat with an authentic wine experience. So everyone who's going is someone who's passionate and like-minded about health, fitness, wellness, travel, adventure, that sort of thing. Excellent. And I just want to cultivate that community in you know very unique, memorable situations and locations around the world. And so that's definitely going to be, you know, a bigger part of my life as, uh, as time goes on. Um, and I, I only moved back to Austin about six months ago and it's just like, I've really delved into like what it means to live actively, even outside of the gym, whether it's, you know, time out on the water, paddle boarding, going for walks in nature, hiking, um, different sports, just like recreationally, uh, it's just like living that lifestyle beyond just the gym is, is becoming increasingly more important to me and doing so in a way that builds community and social life. That's awesome, man. And I, I'll, I'll make this really quick. Cause I know, <laughs> I'm sure you got to get back to work and stuff, but um, yeah, what you said about making your life more active, man, I just realized recently that your neat, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, that's like actually makes up the biggest chunk besides just the calories you burn just for existing, but yeah. like it's, it's actually a bigger chunk than like your exercise as far as calories burned throughout the day. So that's almost mm -hmm. like the biggest lever you can pull as far as burning extra calories. So I think, I think that's a really good thing. That could be a topic for another podcast or something, but, but I think yeah. that's awesome too. Your, your event, you know, that's something I've been getting super passionate about is like in-person stuff. There's just something about the connection you can build with these events that you put on. So that, that's freaking awesome, man. I, I, I can see a big future with stuff like that for you. So very Thank cool. You. Well, Thanks, sweet. Yeah. 
Um, but this guy, Patrick, has a huge following on social media. <laughs> so he's got a big YouTube, Instagram, everything. So what what are your where can people find you? Yeah, Instagram's the easiest way to reach me. It's just at Patrick Lyons. I post every day there. I also post every day on TikTok, which is Patrick underscore Lyons. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn, Patrick Lyons, YouTube, Patrick Lyons. It's that everywhere. That's sweet. Awesome, brother. Well, I appreciate you being on to the very first episode of the Elevate Everyday podcast. Thank you guys for listening. Um, reach out to Patrick if you got any questions. Reach out to me if you got any questions. And I'll, we'll see you in the next episode.